Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This is the show all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager, a farmer, or a food producer selling at farmer's markets, or just a curious farmer's market shopper, this is the podcast for you. This is a very special episode of Tent Talk recorded live at the 2019 Intense Conference. We had quite the stellar lineup of speakers at Intense, and we're lucky to include Marcy Coburn, Executive Director of Coisa. Marcy moderated a very interesting panel called Who Needs More Farmers Markets? Marcy, the panelists, and the audience of conference attendees discussed why new markets are great, when a new market isn't a good idea, and everything in between. So there, our next session, and this is every time I've been at a round table kind of thing at any conference related to farmers markets, farm conferences, that kind of thing, at some point the question comes up, do we need more farmers markets? And everybody has an opinion. Not always the same opinion. <laughs> so this is usually an active discussion, and we think it's an important one. I mean, if, we, if life was perfect, we would have a farmer's market on every corner like we do Starbucks, right? So that everybody could get really fresh food. But there are things about that in terms of the number of farmers available and the amount of money that farmers and vendors need to make and the number of professional managers you've got. So we're going to dig down into that. Uh, our moderator is Marcy Coburn. She's the executive director of Quesa in San Francisco. They operate the Ferry Building Farmers Market, uh, the Mission Mercado, spelled with a D, unlike our Mercado spelled with a T. It's an Italian thing. And the Jack London Square Market in Oakland. So uh, yeah. So, <laughs> And she's going to be leading this discussion, and our other panelists are Amber, I know your name so well, but it's been a really long couple of days. Holland? All right, it's coming back. Good. It's all up there. Some of it's misfiled. Uh, Amber's the operations director now, right, for Portland Farmers Markets. She's been a farmers market manager for a long time. They have multiple markets in Portland. How many nowadays? Five now. Um, like me, she's opened a lot of new markets. Some of them have turned out to be huge successes, and every once in a while, one's a miscalculation, and you have to back off. So she's got a nice uh, insight to that. I understand how that goes, and she's going to share that with us. Alfonso Morales is from Farm to Facts. He's our geeky data guy. So he's going to uh, give us all the numbers about <laughs> farmers' markets and how that works. How's that for a description? It's so sexy. <laughs> geeky data guy. Um, so he's going to give us that kind of viewpoint. And then Megan Baba, who some of you heard yesterday um, from Occidental College. Yes, I can't remember. Uh, also has done a lot of work, a lot of academic work, a lot of study on farmers' markets, and especially bringing fresh food and farmers' markets into food deserts. We all know that that's a really good idea. The trick is to make sure that it's also profitable for farmers. So she's got that insight. And so I think we're going to have a lively discussion. We have planned this session so that there's a lot of time for Q&A at the end, because we know that everybody has an opinion on this. Maybe some of your opinions will change by the time we get to Q&A, but you'll have a chance to throw in your thoughts and your questions. So I will let Marcy take it from here. Thank you. Yay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited to uh, moderate this panel, because this is um, top of mind as the executive of Quesa, where we get um, probably, a, I probably get an email or a phone call once a week from either a, like a developer, like somebody who's building you know, a new project, or a community association wanting me to, to, to throw them a farmer's market, basically, like it's a party, right? And um, it is a party, but it, t it takes a lot more planning than, than that. So, um, and I, I also, Quesa just celebrated its 25th anniversary. I've been the executive there for, it'll be five years in July. And when I started, we were, you know, right after year 20, and my board of directors was, we're a nonprofit, 501c3, charitable organization. My, my nonprofit board of directors, which are all volunteers, wanted uh, Quesa to expand. And at that point, we had only ever been at the Ferry Plaza Farmer's Market and had been there for 20 years. And our farmers, many, 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 or sorry, 15 years now, 10 years at that point, but... Um, in the general vicinity of the ferry building for 20 years, um, but only one market, a few nights or a few days a week, but only that one farmer's market. So many of our sellers also had only ever been there um, with us, and many of them, that's the only farmer's market that they do. So I know that this is a really exceptional sort of situation, um, and we're very privileged because of our location and the draw there and the sort of collateral, the sort of social collateral that goes with that. 
But my board wanted me to expand and, and operate farmers markets other places. So I decided to bring this up as a topic of discussion at our annual seller meetings, which are 150 sellers who get together once a year. It's a mandatory meeting. And I put it on the agenda at the end of the meeting. And I was like, what do you guys think about another farmers market like down the road? And it was like full anarchy. Like the <laughs> farmers were like, I, I, it was so surprising to me. Farmers did not want more farmers markets. They were pissed about, um, sorry, this is on a podcast, sorry. They were PO'd um, about, <laughs> you'll have to edit that out. Um, they were PO'd because they were like, we don't make as much money here as we used to. It takes twice as much time. It takes twice as much work. We're making half of what we used to make because of all of the clutter in the space and all of the farmers markets. Like more farmers markets is not the answer. And you know, we don't want you to do this. And so it was a huge learning experience for me. Um, we did go on to actually um, take over other farmers markets that were already in existence. And that has been the model we are in the mission and in Oakland now. And, and that has been the model there. And that's actually, to me, I feel like much more sustainable. But it's an interesting conversation, right? And I'm sure everyone in this room has an opinion on it. And I hope to hear from you. But we're going to hear from the panelists, too. So we're going to start with the sort of big, bigger question of, like, why more farmers markets? Like, why are we asking this question? Okay. So do you want to just start here, or do you guys want to popcorn around? Do you feel a burning sense? Alfonso, you kind of framed it initially. Do you want to, do you want to why don't you start, actually, and, um, and just tell us why, you're at, why you even want to know why we're asking this question. Sure. So uh, the, th the other thing, so Farm to Facts, just to be clear about this, is a data collection program I designed and is useful to farmers, market managers. But my, my work is as a professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And I've written on food, sub food system subjects extensively for 20 years. So the reason why I framed it this way was to ask this question about who, who, who thinks of this as a problem. To ask this question sort of implies that there's a problem. And the question is, is who is it a problem for? And so there's consequent questions that follow from that. When I think about the number of farmers markets in the country, first of all, we don't even know how many there are, right? I had a doctoral student working on, in Wisconsin on the question of SNAP and EBT benefits in, in farmers markets in Wisconsin. And she found an undercount of the USDA database in Wisconsin by about 15%. So and this was three years ago. Now, this is a, we know this is a shifting field. Another way. Another entree to this question is to ask, let me ask the managers here. How many folks, right, are, are, uh, manage uh, a market? Okay, now keep your hands up. Those of you that manage markets, how many of you does your market operate more than one day a week? Okay, those of you whose market operates more than one day a week, now look at, pay attention here, how many of you whose market operates more than one day a week think of yourselves as having more than one market? Yeah, about half. Okay, so, so the definition, our own definition of what constitutes a market is in question. Is a market one day a week uh, with the same name? Right? Did y'all follow the little exercise there? Okay, so... So there's a number of, of, uh, of ways to approach this. And I think I'll stop there and pass it off because I'm an academic. <laughs> we'll stop there. All right. So who, who has a, a burning interpretation and or version of why, ask why, more markets? Um, I can go. Go ahead. Um, Make it. So, so I work in a capacity that's sort of... Um, bridges a little bit between research or academics and nonprofits. So I work at an institute at Occidental College that does sort of research-based projects. Um, so we do a lot of pilot programs and then research related to those pilot programs. Um, and I was saying to Marcy earlier that uh, I guess I've spent the last two and a half years spending a lot of time at struggling farmers markets and trying to figure out why they're struggling. Is <laughs> sort of the nature of my research. Um, but I think uh, I come from the food access and food justice world, 
And so the reason why we ask this question in that world is has to do with how to get more healthy, fresh, um, organic with a lowercase o, um, as in not necessarily certified, but organically produced. Um, how do we get more of that kind of food into places that need more access to healthy food? Um, and I guess that's sort of where it comes from in that world. And my understanding from spending some time interviewing market managers who were involved in sort of the movement for farmers markets uh, in the 70s in California um, was that it really came, a lot of it came out of that world. Um, the sort of the food assistance and uh, emergency food, uh, church uh, food pantries, that kind of world. There were a lot of the big advocates for farmers markets. So that, that connection has always existed. But I think the, the question then comes up for me with that question is, are farmers markets in the very narrow definition that we make for them, at least in California with certified farmers markets, are those the answer to that food access question? Or are there other ways to get at that same issue? Okay, Amber, thoughts on why ask why? Why ask why? Uh, so Portland Farmers Market is in a city of about 2 million people, and we have about 40 farmers markets there. Um, food access is certainly something that we consider, but uh, we really look for ways to make sure that our farmers are successful. And our experience with um, new markets popping up is that typically they are done so because of the the experience of being at a farmer's market and having a farmer's market in your community and what that brings and how um, how that brings community together. And my criticism is that there's oftentimes little consideration for what it takes for a farmer to walk away and be successful. You know, we, we have smaller markets. We're all, not all of our markets are, are large. Um, about half of our markets are quite small. One is at about 10 vendors. And I know that there's a farmer threshold of about $500 there at that market. And if we see any farmers drop below that level, then we are not serving who we're meant to serve, which is the farmers. Um, we want communities to have farmers markets, and we certainly want that access piece to be there. But first, who's your farmer, and what can you guarantee them for success? Guarantee capital, or lowercase g. Mm -hmm. um, because there are no guarantees, of course. But if, if you are bringing a diverse farm to a farmer's market and you're looking at them not knowing how many shoppers are going to be there, not having a plan for that, or not knowing uh, how successful they can be because either you don't have the experience or your motivation for opening this market is strictly community-based, then we're diluting the success of the other farmers' markets that have existed and that have had vendors be successful at those markets. Um, one of our main, one of the things that um, farmers' markets really struggle with is getting vendors. And my response to that is that that's the first thing you need. You can't just close down a street and bring the people and not have any food for them to purchase. So that's kind of where we're at. We have a lot of farmers markets. We have um, a big community around our farmers markets, but we also have farmers markets that'll open up a mile down the road from another farmers market on the same day at the same time. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. So that's my question yeah, yeah. to them. Are you trying to bring something really special and awesome to your community, are you trying to compete with the neighboring community that now we've, we've split the shopper base in half? It's not good for anybody, and primarily it's not good for the, for the farmers and vendors. So let's talk numbers for a second. Thank you for that. Um, so the estimate is that there are 10,000 farmers markets in the United States. This is you know, very loose estimate, because it's really hard to say. Um, I know that I have heard somewhere between two and six percent of the population shop in farmers markets, supposedly, probably more concentrated in urban areas and less com concentrated in rural areas, I would assume. Maybe. Or what, I mean, do we have any other concrete data, Alfonso, that we can play with here? Yeah, excellent. So, so, so it is interesting. So we, we need to remember not to dichotomize this, not to split it between rural and urban. Right? There is a big gradient from very large cities with many markets, right, to middle sized cities like Madison, Wisconsin, that serve, you know, Dane County is about half a million people, about 30 markets, to smaller towns, to towns of a thousand people with a market with a half a dozen vendors, right? And so, market farms, farmers can be successful across that gradient, markets can be successful across that gradient. To quote Amber, 
The special awesome experience of a market can be represented in its own particular way across that gradient, right? So one of the numbers that, that uh, which, Megan, you're, you're going to, will you reference the 3% from, yeah. No, no, Amber said that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt that back to you, okay? I'm going to punt that back to you. But, uh, but uh, I apologize. But the, 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 I think the thing to remember is that, that uh, irrespective of the size of the community or the size of the number of vendors at the market, there can be uh, an, an, uh, 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 many goals can be fulfilled. I think we need to think in terms of what makes something special and awesome. There's always several dimensions, right? There's social dimension of it. There's economic dimension of it. Maybe there's more than one social dimension of it, depending on the... Uh, the community and how demographically complex it is. Is there a lot of senior citizens in there? Well, you can bring a lot of senior citizens to a market and make it vibrant in its own way and fulfill many goals that way. But so, so again, I could speak to this question for a while, but I think that the notion is that there's not one particular uh, break even, you might say, not a tipping point for number of vendors or, or number of consumers. I think a lot of it is really contingent on the community. Amber, you had you quoted some research um, that you heard about the three percent. Is that yeah? I stole it. You stole it. Great. <laughs> totally stole it. Uh, so uh, Chris Curtis recently retired um, manager, executive director of Seattle Neighborhood Farmers Markets, did some research a few years back about really trying to dial in with. Um, shoppers that weren't attending farmer's markets. And a couple things stuck out, and because we're on a podcast, I'm gonna be really careful not to quote anything because my memory's not that great. But a couple <laughs> things that stood out that um, she shared is um, one, that the average regular, self-identified regular shopper comes to markets once a month. That's what a regular shopper thinks that is a regular supporting shopper. Um, and that she felt pretty confident that 3% of the population of any particular community will shop farmer's markets, and she really hasn't seen that change. Um, she's not as geeky with numbers, but she's still pretty geeky. I hope she hears that. Um, and that 3% number, I think what she took away from this and really sitting down with these focus groups with shoppers that weren't attending markets, and that's what I thought was really interesting about her her um, approach or the approach for this particular study is asking people, why aren't you going? What are the barriers to you? And why, why aren't we seeing you at the market either at all or more than once a month? Um, and I think the takeaway was that um, there's probably more value in putting effort into turning those regular lowercase r shoppers into truly regular shoppers coming, coming regularly once a week and doing their, their basic grocery shopping. Or once a month. So, yeah, something more than once a month, but getting the shoppers that are already coming to your market to spend more and invest more into the food that's there and also getting them to come more than once a month. Which doesn't really address accessibility because we, we know that that number is, is not going to be people from disenfranchised neighborhoods or areas where there aren't historically farmers markets. So, Megan, can you talk about those numbers and what what you know, you've seen in terms of what makes a successful or not successful market in, in some neighborhoods you've researched? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't have a lot of numbers to share on that. Um, unfortunately, I guess most of the research we've done is pretty qualitative. But what I would say about that and sort of what that brings up um, is sort of because there obviously is enormous value in kind of retaining your customers. And I think I've heard that from other folks who've done research in farmer's markets where they're kind of talking about trying to reach the people kind of on the cusp, like people who come a few times a year, you know, who aren't really committed, but they occasionally come, which makes a lot of sense rather than there are some people who are just never going to shop at a farmer's market. Um, and that really doesn't have to do that much with income. There are some people who have tons of money and they're just not interested. Um, but then likewise, there are also people who don't have a lot of money who are interested, but they're interested for slightly different reasons. And I think those are the cases where I think that logic maybe doesn't apply. Um, I think a lot of the work we've been doing is really about kind of changing the narrative of what a farmer's market is and who it's serving. Um, because I think, I was just talking about this last night with some folks, the sort of, um, the more that the kind of farmer's market lifestyle um, kind of gets 
portrayed and pitched as this kind of hipster culture, um, you know, with someone was talking about, uh, you know, printed t-shirts with, you know, these like really cute uh, block prints of flowers and, um, you know, that kind of like, oh, get your like market color palette on. Um, and I think that's really alienating to a lot of people. Um, we did a number of focus groups with shoppers at our farmer's markets who were all using EBT at the market, who are all using or utilizing WIC or market, uh, market match nutrition incentive programs, um, the majority of whom were immigrants or first generation, um, first generation immigrants, children of immigrants. Um, and they are really interested in organic food and really interested in uh, a social interaction with the person that they're buying it from. And they're really interested in recreating the experience they had in the countries that they came from where uh, there's a million different words for a farmer's market. You know, we started not translating the word farmer's market because there's too many words in Spanish that mean something equivalent, and it just depends on which country you're coming from. So we just started going with, well, let's just call it a farmer's market. People know what that is. Um, but it means something different. Yeah. And I think that we, if we're going to be inclusive and actually get farmer's markets to work um, for all people in all communities, we need to rethink kind of the way markets are branded. Um, because if it's only branded one way, then yeah, we're only gonna keep those customers, but it could appeal to more people. Right, um, so, and I, do you, I, sure, I, go ahead. Let me just take onto that for one second. So in the contemporary, the last 50 years, right, a lot of folks think that one of the, the, the first new farmer's market, quote unquote, was Berkeley. 67, 68, 69. And the second one was Madison, Wisconsin, the Dane County, the downtown farmer's market. That's what a lot of people say now. I know that a lot, we all know that a lot of markets have been persisting for a long time in other places. But that was the, the inception of that stereotype, mm -hmm. right? The upper middle class folks wanting a particular, wanting to recreate uh, the sensory perception of that tomato or that peach from Kat's first talk yesterday, right? And in the 70s, whenever you read about these things, about farmer's markets, you can, you can see people writing articles, want a farmer's market? Start your own. That's the title of articles from the 70s, okay? Because, so this was about folks with uh, experience, an understanding of organizations, an understanding, a, a reasonable understanding of how to get something done, and recognizing that there are multiple intersecting processes that have to be woven together to get a market done. You all know this, right? And so uh, from that, there's been a lot of efforts to reach out past that 3% of largely middle class, upper middle class, across that gradient, uh, because I'm not entirely sure that that's the only way forward. I think that that's a viable way forward, but it's probably not the only way forward to not just enhance food security, but uh, in, improve economic outcomes for farmers and fulfill a lot of other goals, health-related and other goals that's, that we could have for our communities. So it does come back to this question, though, of why, why are we asking the question? Like, what are we all after in terms of a farmer's market? Are we supporting farmers? Are we mission-driven? Quesa has a mission to educate people about food and where food comes from. And so we're making, when we're making decisions about expanding our markets, it's about who are we reaching and, you know, uh, new communities and audiences that maybe weren't being... Um, sort of indoctrinated to our thinking before and we can reach them if we have a market in that neighborhood? Um, is it, you know, because of uh, another sort of social mission? Um, are you just a farmer's market association that, or organization that is for profit and wants to make more money and you make, you know, you've done sort of your uh, analysis of how much capital you, or, you know, revenue you can generate and so you need to create five or ten more this year in order to be profitable or whatever, right? Everyone's coming from a different place and so... Um, and, then, and then there's the pressures on the other side, which, like I was saying at the beginning, where uh, developers have a brand new development. They've spent, you know, millions of dollars on a beautiful new subdivision type or, you know, where, where I work in Dogpatch, there's all these, you know, new beautiful developments, et cetera. And they think that a farmer's market will bring people to that neighborhood and bring people down to that new coffee shop and that, um, you know, leather store and the jean store or whatever. And so... 
and you know, it's often the conversation I'm having where I'm saying, no, it's the opposite. You have to have a critical mass of people, a critical mass of, of cross traffic and foot traffic and people coming and going and commuters and, you know, who will shop. Otherwise, you can't, it's not a situation where you throw a beautiful farmer's market, you bring farmers down there, they get up at 3 a.m., they harvest their crops, they bring them down there and they're just wilting on the sidewalk because there's no people to purchase what they've, you know, brought. So back to this question, um, we've got about five minutes before we go to Q&A, but like, what should farmer's market operators do um, who are being asked and what should they be thinking about, on, you know, in terms of whether or not they should start a new market? I'll add to that and what what is the trade-off? So we are a pretty established organization with a lot of support and we have closed a market, one market a year for the last two years. So we, we were at seven markets and now we're at five. And that feels, talk about my feelings for a minute, like failure or <laughs> shrinking or whatever. And when I really start to think about, I'm not any less busy, that's for sure. <laughs> I am able to curate, to support, to, to uh, educate, outreach, all of those things to really build a team around those um, aspirations for our five remaining farmers market in a way where we are not stretched so thin, where we're not walking into our own market and going, there's barely any produce here, or this is not, this is not what we want for our vendors, it's not what we want for our communities. And with the closure of two markets over the last two seasons, we've really been able to um, confidently build our remaining markets because they are in very similar areas. They're next to each other. We had the two markets that we closed were about a mile or two away from um, our flagship market, which is on Saturday. They were on different days of the week, but they weren't serving the community. And so by closing those two markets, our organization increased its capacity to serve more vendors, to serve more shoppers, to be more, um, to be here, to, to, do, to do things and be part of this community in a real way. Great. Um, sure. Um, I would say that very similarly, when people are thinking about starting a farmer's market, they should ask themselves, what am I trying to accomplish with this? Um, most of the people who I've talked to who are in that boat are generally people who've been given a grant. Um, since I am in the nonprofit uh, sort of public health scene, they've been given a grant, and the grant is to start a farmer's market. And the people who gave them that grant are doing it for the sort of public health food access reason, and they're completely overlooking the farmer benefit. Uh, and they're not even thinking about it. People think about farmer's markets as an amenity when they're a livelihood for how 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 individual small businesses. And so I think, um, I think we all need to try and educate people about that. <laughs> um, and. Um, and then I think people need to get more creative about how do you create the experience and the benefit of a farmer's market, maybe without it actually being a farmer's market. And there's not a lot of models for that. But I think things like you know a pop-up market or a mini grocery store or more food hubs or local distributors who can give farmers access and those sales that they really need and access to those urban markets without the enormous risk and opportunity costs that come with going to a farmer's market. So I think just there needs to be a lot more creativity happening. Um, you mean direct sales opportunities for farmers? Yeah, basically. direct sales or even indirect sales, um, but that kind of serve that same purpose. Because there's only so many markets you can go to, and there's only so many farmers in each region who are kind of in your pool. But those farmers still need to sell more product. So, but it's like if the only thing people are thinking about is oh, farmers market, farmers market, and they're not thinking about is there another way we could accomplish the same thing. So my take on this is to reflect for just a moment on how confident Amber was in what she just said, right? We closed markets and we marched forward. Now, I think that that's really vital. And the reason why I created this software program was to enable market managers to do decision making of that sort with a lot of confidence, right? To have connections in their community, to recognize the various functions, the various benefits that markets provide, economic, ecological, et cetera, and to do that in a way that's not a lot of work and uh, very reliable scientifically with a lot of scientific integrity. Now, having said that, there's a lot of ways forward in this world of decision making. What matters is those core values of connecting to the community and 
caring about what we're up to and advancing the prospects of, of the community in its various dimensions, right? So in, so in my view, that is where the action is. I can, I can put on different hats, right? I can put on the academic hat. I can put on this data geek hat, the farm to facts hat. I can put on the shopper to farmer's market hat. I can put on the vendor hat, because I've been a vendor. I grew up in farming and ranching, and, and don't do it to make a living anymore, but grew up in it. And yeah, don't do it, huh? So <laughs> I, think, I, think that the, I think that the point is, I think that the real point is, is that given that we each have these perspectives and recognize these multiple dimensions, to try at, er, at, every, at any point to have that confidence in that decision making, which I think is so valuable, however you do it, I wish that for you. Right? in recognizing those dimensions. However you recognize those dimensions, I hope you can recognize them and act on the opportunities that you can find in each one. Awesome, we're gonna open up to questions now. So um, we're gonna give one of these mics, yeah. So yeah, questions, comments, thoughts, observations. Yeah, Kat, you need a mic. Already have oh, you have a mic, okay. Tim turns me on, I already have a mic. <laughs> so powerful. <laughs> All the power. Um, one question I'd just like to bring up. So the one advantage to opening new markets, does the ferry building have room for more farmers? No. Okay, Amber, Portland State, the big market in Portland. Do you, are you still taking farmers? Yeah. You are? Okay. So we're, we've got some categories of farmers that are really big markets here that we can still sneak in. We've got a mushroom guy that just came in. He's awesome. But a lot of other categories we can't. We just have hit the point where we've got enough tomato farmers that if we add another tomato farmer, the ones we've got aren't going to make any money. So what about the purpose in terms of new markets of giving access to new farmers? We've got a lot of young farmers coming up. And at this point, our markets are so mature. They're, you know, they're big markets open for 11 years, we're not going to kick one of those guys out that's been with us for 11 years. Where do the new farmers go? For sure, for Quesa, it was, it was really great when we had other markets because we could also, um, someone could start in another market and also sort of um, get get their chops before right. coming that's to the big show at the ferry building, which is its own kind of monster because, you know, during peak right. season, we get 100,000 people there. So it is hard to start there right. and there's no space. When I started, there was like a waiting list that was like eight years long. So it was a way to also prioritize um, businesses that were owned by people of color and women and LGBTQI because we had more markets in order to put those businesses in um, to those markets where the the um, embargo on the ferry building had been established for 20 years, right? And it's like feet first for people to leave that farmer's market. So, um, you know, farmers are not leaving until they retire. And so it's very, yeah, it, it definitely changed the game in terms of us being able to provide opportunities for up and coming farmers for sure and, and business owners and sellers. And it was important for sure. Uh, Back, back to the capacity issue or capacity benefits, I guess, of, of closing down markets. You, f you figure you're losing opportunities for vendors or farmers. Um, we have expanded our markets. And I know that not that's not an opportunity for everybody, but uh, our downtown market, a few years back, we closed down a, neighbor, a, a nearby adjacent street, and we moved all of our hot food vendors out into that so that we could bring in more farmers because there is... There is opportunity there, physical space. I think there are creative ways to get around that. If you've got 100,000 people coming to a farmer's market, chances are adding one or two more farmers isn't necessarily going to tap into the sales or success of another farmer. Um, same with PSU, we've expanded to three blocks. We have brought in another anchor farmer because we needed them there. And we also are uh, looking around at the existing farmers that have been there for a long time and they're, and they're preparing to retire. So there's, we're in a little bit of a different situation, so we're acknowledging that we need to succession plan for some of our bigger, more, more stable and um, just anchor farmers. And so we're able to do that with a little bit of an expansion and bringing in some smaller folks, smaller scale farmers that can grow into those positions over the next few years as we see retirement coming. Um, and in the meantime, their scale is small enough to where they're not um, hurting the overall success of farmers at the market. 
All right, I have a question over here. Can I add something oh, to yeah. that before mm -hmm. we move on? Yes, quickly. Um, I think it's such an interesting question, um, and I do think that farmers markets um, do play this really interesting role in incubating small businesses. I think not just on the farmer end, but on the prepared food end. Um, and that's something I already see happening is that the sort of struggling markets or smaller, newer markets will kind of incubate businesses that are just starting because that a, a bigger, more established market won't take or that that business can't handle yet. And so these struggling markets can kind of take on these brand new food businesses and kind of give them this space, which is a really cool thing that's kind of happening organically and maybe something that could be explored and kind of made more intentional um, in a way that could kind of benefit both. Just talking a little bit about what Kat was saying, um, when you're trying to expand your market and people are contacting you to be in the market, I caution against using the term waiting list because what I found was people would come into the market, the one that's popular, my most popular market, and they would see empty space. So they have peaches and they would call me and we would say, we're going to put you on a waiting list. And they said, well, you have space. So we've tried to train ourselves now to say, we'll put you on an interest list. And if we have an opening in your category, we're looking at all the people who have expressed interest in that. It's harder to do, but it also saves from getting people angry with you about seeing that you have space and you're telling them you don't have space for them. We have that problem a so, lot too at our market. People say, put me on the list. And I said, well, it's not a list. Really. <laughs> so the, while the second question comes up, that just points out the relationship of supply chain considerations, right? Mm -hmm. A way to respond to Kat's question and what you just said is that market managers are constantly integrating different supply chains. And one of the co concerns that f folks have is access to farmland, close enough to a market that makes a, a viable vendor possible. So as you think about this question of, of how many markets, how many farmers, and, and one of the things to think about is farmland access and, and beginning farmers programs and similar sorts of things. Data that you can collect yourselves as well, right, to advance the, the prospects for those folks. The more that we have systematic understanding of those things, the better we can advance policy questions. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question over here I think I saw, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So um, my name is Ben Feldman. I'm with the Farmers Market Coalition. And uh, one of the things I think that this question or this, this discussion gets at that's really interesting is um, and maybe it's one of the uh, why I forget exactly what, what, what why ask the I forget exactly how you phrase it. But the point being, um, why do we expect farmers markets to do all so many things like we, we do farmers markets do. Uh, it's because they can, right? It's because they can. But farmers markets provide a whole suite of services to, to communities and society. They can be effective tools um, to address food insecurity. They can be effective tools for economic generation. They can be effective tools for farm viability. Um, and so I think we've developed these expectations um, that farmers markets are everything to everybody. And um, and so how, so, and, and Maybe that's partly because they, they can do a lot of those things. Um, but why do we expect that of farmers markets when we don't expect that of a grocery store, right? We don't expect a grocery store um, to, to fill a role in communities at, at um, providing food access, um, maybe a limited role. But we don't look to them to lead the issue, right? We don't look to them to be proactive. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we get to a place where farmers markets are supported to do these things? Because I think many of us know how, how um, limited resource and how markets want to do these things. Um, and then how um, do we also recognize the limitations of farmers markets and where they're not, sort of to your point, where they're not the right tool to achieve their objective and how do we support those efforts too? Um, so that's... My question. Sorry. It's a yeah, big one. great question. Can I just address sure, it go right for off? It. So it's very interesting because we all know that markets are organized in different ways. Some are cities, some are bids, some are Main Street programs, some are private, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's at least nine business models that I've identified for a farmer's market to be organized under. And the, the uh, 
Each of those means that you each have, each market manager has their own goals and objectives. Notwithstanding, true, what Ben said is true. And society, right, can impose whatever expectations it wants, uh, but you don't have to accept them. And you won't, right? You're the, you're the investigator of your market. You're the boss of your market. You're gonna make the choices about how to, you know, who's next and how you've broken down and so I think it's important to bear that in mind. Now, having said that, nonetheless, there are multiple goals that markets serve, right? There are multiple social, economic, et cetera, goals that markets serve. No reason not to claim the ability to advance those goals, right? No reason not to be able to say, hey, not only do we do these principal things, but there's a variety of other things that we do as well. A hundred years ago, uh, markets were becoming, there was a big problem with uh, food scarcity in big cities. And markets became the tool of choice for big cities. I've written about this in other publications. And, and city, big cities across the country said, looked to Europe and said, we need a market for food security to employ women and the handicapped, right? The temporarily dislocated, right? Uh, and uh, new immigrant populations for whom markets were very familiar. Right? thinking of Eastern European and Southern European immigrants principally at the time. So uh, uh, back to the future, as it were, right? And, the, the, and we can expect these things to recur. The main thing is, is that you get to kind of, as the managers, right, you're making these choices yourselves and responding when it serves your purposes to communicate the various benefits you're having in your community. I love this question also. This um, just want to say really quickly, um, Kat was quoted in an article that I read doing some research for this from San Diego Magazine, which talked about, a, it was comparing church to farmer's markets and saying that um, over the last you know, decade, um, people, less people are attending church on a regular basis, but more people go to farmer's markets. And I think it's really interesting to think about um, how we, there are fewer and fewer opportunities in our modern culture, our modern world, where we all come together in one place. You can go to the grocery store anytime, 24 hours a day. You're not going to see your neighbors and your friends and your community, but you go to the farmer's market in particular one day a week if you're a regular and you're going to see, you know, your whole community there and the people that you love and care about. And so as we also see in tech, these tech solutions that come along and very uh, publicly fail, um, the most recent being Munchery, which is you know a food delivery service um, that um, went out of business recently in the Bay Area and left a bunch of sellers and farmers unpaid and employees unpaid and so huge you know drama because they took millions in um, venture capital and then very publicly shut down. Um, so we're also seeing that I think this is an interesting time for farmers markets because more, as people are, so, it's sort of the counter note to having everything be outsourced, having all the shopping outsourced, all the cooking outsourced, everything outsourced. It's like we're the anecdote to that in a lot of ways. And so it really speaks to this, the, the other things that are happening in farmers markets besides I'm just getting my lettuce and my kale and my oranges for the week. Um, and and I think, you know, I think we are doing a lot with them, but it's also an interesting time to sort of think about and talk about what it is we're doing and how we as a people need it more and more. Other thoughts on that question that Ben had? I'm still taking I have a, Yeah, I have a couple other questions here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a fast talker. It's okay, I'm over here. Okay. I'm gonna have Ben ask questions. He's a farmer, so I'm interested in that. Um, yeah, so going back to kind of Kat's question about, you know, how do you create opportunities for new farmers? Um, I almost have this, this uh, very kind of cutthroat capitalistic perspective that I'm curious what your thoughts are on. <laughs> um, because oftentimes you see at farmer's markets, they get very stagnant over time as the veteran vendors just kind of sit there and they can keep their space, um, especially at older farmer's markets like the one that I sell at. And uh, I guess my kind of thinking about this is, what if we just raise the rates? Um, so that a lot of these farmers who are just there because they've been there forever and the market has kind of grown around them. Um, but they're not really making any money, but they're, they're able to keep their spot, which is stagnating the younger farmers from rising up and um, also forcing us to create new markets for these young vendors, um, which just spreads out the competition. So yeah, I'm just curious what you guys think about that kind of perspective. 
<laughs> cutthroat, cutthroat, raise the price. Um, so we, so one in um, comment to your raising the price. So we uh, implemented a peak season pricing for this year, and I think that that has. We're a year-round farmer's market. We had the same fees from January through December. And we all know, well, we're in California. Maybe your sales are consistent because your weather is consistent. But in Oregon, that's not the case. So your, your sales are much higher May through September. And so we implemented a peak pricing. And I think what that kind of did was encourage the vendors to stick it out through the winter because now it's a lower price um, and to, to pay a little more during the summer. So the summer months are now sort of subsidizing the winter months, which was really beneficial for our organization. But to your point of how do you keep them fresh and new, and I think that comes to, we get approached a lot because people want us to show up in their neighborhood and recreate our flagship market that's 25 years old. That's what they want, and they want 100 vendors on day one, and they want all the stuff and all the things. Well, we have built in our capacity to continue expanding, so if, if farmer A is being complacent and just kicking it, we're going to bring in somebody who's going to encourage cutthroat style um, to up their game a little bit, to, to really set your display in a way that's beautiful, to have produce that people want to buy, to have practices that people want to support. Um, and we're not afraid to bring that comp competition in. We do so very, very slowly. Um, one farm at a time, but I have a goal of uh, a professional goal to bring in a new farm or one or new one or two new farms every year, and um, you know we look for products that are really different. We look for farmers that are 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 starting out and willing to adjust their offerings so that they are able to bring in something that isn't redundant. We're we're all good with kale. We don't need any more <laughs> kale. Are you interested in growing something different than that, or perhaps you'd like to or cabbage? Or perhaps you'd like to harvest that kale a little younger, so it's baby kale, and call it something different. But we really look for farms that are that are willing to do that. All right, we have time for about two more questions. I know you guys have been waiting here, so I'm going to grab these two, and then we're going to wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was really inspired this morning by Charlotte's and Allie's talks about your target customer and when you're trying to sell to everybody, you're selling to no one. Um, so I was just wondering what happens when there's alignment. You know, I sort of have always thought about each farmer's market vendor should choose their target customer and market to them and display to them. But what happens when the market has a target customer and the vendor has that same target customer and how does that change things? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, that's definitely something we've been trying to work uh, with our kind of pilot markets with. Um, and again, these are markets that are in primarily or at least significantly low-income neighborhoods. And so again, it kind of comes into that issue of farmers markets sort of display the wrong messaging for that population. And so we've been trying, it's a little challenging, but trying to work with markets to really think about what their market looks like and creating that welcoming atmosphere to the population that lives in that community, um, which can be as simple as bilingual signs that have a lot of images on them um, that are kind of like happy and um, not sort of like, you know, slick and boutique-y, but more, um, more accessible because they don't look, actually, they actually look a little bit maybe less professional or less sort of corporate. Um, having an eating area that's really well lit and, um, you know, has a, where you feel like you can bring your kids to, um, having a really clearly marked manager booth that has signage about all the different food assistance programs in as many languages as you are able to print them in. Um, and I think that kind of thing sounds really basic, but I, I very seldom see it done, actually. Um, and I think, yeah, that there, there does need to be that intention. I think one of the challenges that comes up is um, getting vendors to think about themselves as part of a community and not about their own little individual stall. And I think that actually does happen a little bit more organically at smaller markets because they kind of have to and the vendors aren't that busy so they can talk to each other. Um, but I saw we had a really amazing case at one market where there was a, a sushi vendor um, 
and then a fruit grower, and both of the owners of those businesses were Korean. And so they would actually go work at each other's stalls and chat with each other and kind of translate things for each other because they're the only people in the market who spoke Korean. Um, but you know, you have a sushi guy working at a you know Pluot stall, then you're like, why? How is this happening? <laughs> but um, and they're really watching out for each other and like giving each other tips on their signage and reaching people. Um, and so I think obviously at a bigger market, it's harder to cultivate that sense of community. But to kind of um, to to really for managers to communicate to all of their vendors like, hey, there's a reason why we're asking you to put up the sign that says you accept EBT, and there's a reason why we're asking you to make your um, stall look a little bit different. And it's for the health and the vitality of the whole market. It's not like we're punishing you or something like that. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can speak to um, the, the transition that Quasa made between being only at the Ferry Building and then being in the Mission and in Oakland because the brands of each of those markets is very different. And um, the Mission Mercado, all the, you know, everything is bilingual and we really um, pull from the local community in terms of the sellers and the vendor mix and the shoppers. Same in Oakland. Um, a classic story for us was that the operations team was staunchly against um, kettle corn and bouncy houses because those were two things that they saw was, were very off-brand for us, right? It was like, we will not have farmer's markets with kettle corn and bouncy houses. And then as we grew and expanded, we still don't have bouncy houses, but we do have kettle corn <laughs> in the Mission and in Oakland. And it's because the people, because it's very family friendly, you know, we do work with the sellers to source, you know, locally grown organic corn and not non-GMO sugar and, all, you know, things that matter to us, but it's still kettle corn and, you know, we have had to adjust and so I do think it, that's a really interesting point that you're part of an ecosystem when you're in a market that's part of a community and hopefully if it's being run well and done well it is really part of that community and so your product is going to need to whatever you're selling or your farm is going to need to sort of tweak a little bit to fit into that ecosystem in that market in that neighborhood right you can't it can't just be one one size fits all I think that's really interesting. Um, like Amber, I have run a farmer's market year-round in Portland, and like Amber as well, people, if we were to open another market, they want it to look just like the Hillsdale Farmer's Market. And there's a customer-consumer thing in their mind that it has to have X number of vendors. I can make a market, and Amber and I, between the two of us, could come up with six vendors that would have everything that is grown in Oregon and Washington and it would be the best quality stuff, but people don't see that as a market because it's too small. And I've been struggling with different ways that we can extend our reach to other parts of Southwest Portland where we're located and not be a full market. It could be pop-up, we're looking at that, but there's this, I don't know, has anyone looked at how to come over, overcome that consumer? Um, stereotype. Free, free, stereotype, right? really, It's a yes. stereotype, right? And so what, these, what your comments, similar ones, point out is that that success is, produces a perception of a particular kind in a particular group of people, right? So that relationship is solid. Congratulations, right? That's great, that's good news. Then the point is, is how, like Megan's saying, how do you build new relationships that are stronger? This goes back, right, really to Ben's really good question, right? Because if you're gonna be uh, the same thing to different people, to more people, than it's going to be to different people, right? And so how do you appeal to those different people? You've got to build relationships. You've got to build relationships. There's got to be that same interaction that those people begin to have with your place that is, from their view, their unique interaction, right? Even though, from your view, it's just different. It, I mean, it's, it, it, it just means more success, right? It just means you've, in, you've engaged a different... Uh, sub-demographic. And how to do that, I think you listen to Megan's good advice in this regard, right? And there are other creative ways to do it, kind of depending on the demographic that you're working with. And I'm, I think that among others, the Farmers Market Coalition has good resources for thinking creatively about that sort of thing. Great, now that we've solved this question, <laughs> I guess we'll leave it there. Are we done? Is yeah, that a wrap? Yeah, okay, thanks. thank you everyone, really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening along. Please leave us a review on iTunes and let us know how you liked today's episode. 
Be sure, be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next one. And if you want more farmer's market tips, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter at intensebusiness.com and follow us on Instagram at intensebusiness. That's I-N-T-E-N-T-S, business. The 2019 Intense Conference was such a hit. Please keep in touch with us via social media and keep an eye out for exciting news about what's next for Intense. This podcast is produced by Intense Business, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Special thanks to San Diego Markets and the Intense Conference.